get started in another minute. Okay, I have one o'clock on my watch, so I'm going to go ahead and get things started. Um, welcome to everybody attending, and thank you for attending this webinar about plastic in the ocean. Um, my name is Emily Davenport, and I work for the University of Georgia in the Marine Science Department on campus. And I work for a group called EcoGig, which is a grant funded program um, we were started after the 2010 Deepwater Horizon oil spill. EcoGig stands for Ecosystem Impacts of Oil and Gas Inputs to the Gulf. Um, but I talk to people um, about all sorts of ocean related topics. And so today I wanted to share a little bit about plastic in the ocean. Um, just a couple of housekeeping notes before I get started. One, um, I am in Georgia and our weather today is not pretty. Um, so hopefully I won't lose power in the middle of this webinar. We'll just keep our fingers crossed. Um, two, if at any point in time you can't hear me or you have a question, please put it in the chat. Um, there is the option to raise your hand here, but that doesn't pop up for me when I'm doing a screen share like I'm doing right now. Um, so it's easiest for me if you just put your question into the chat box and I have the chat box up and I can see um, whatever you type in there. So if you have a question along the way or if you can't hear me or, or something I'm sharing for some reason, put that in the chat for me, please. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, if my slides will advance, okay. So this is a little um, GIF that shows that there are five ocean basins in our world, um, the Arctic, Atlantic, Pacific, Indian, and Antarctic oceans, but they really are all interconnected to make one world ocean. And this is important when we're talking about plastic in the ocean. And it's also important to remember that we are all upstream from an ocean somewhere. For example, if you're in the United States and you happen to live in one of these states, um, if you live in the Mississippi watershed, which can reach all the way up into Montana, um, that Mississippi River watershed drains 41% of the continental U United States into the Gulf of Mexico. So there's a pretty decent chance that you throw something plastic into a river in Montana, it's going to eventually make its way down to the Gulf of Mexico and then from there out into the Pacific Ocean, or I mean the Atlantic Ocean, sorry. <laughs> um, I was born in Washington State, so I just say Pacific no matter what. Um, anyway, so uh, just that's something to keep in mind that we are all upstream from an ocean. 
and whatever we do influences our oceans in some way. Okay, so we as a species produce a lot of waste each year. We produce 2.5 billion tons of waste and at least 275 million tons of that is plastic. And that is a lot of waste. And unfortunately, even though I'm sure some of us, especially those of you watching, hopefully do your best to responsibly manage that plastic waste by recycling it, um, a lot of it is not responsibly managed. And even the way we recycle isn't necessarily correct and it doesn't necessarily and make that plastic waste end up in the right place. Um, and so that means that about 8 million tons of plastic that should be recycled or managed more responsibly ends up in the ocean, which is a lot. And this is every year. <clears throat> and the most common types of plastic that are found in our ocean are food wrappers, beverage bottles, grocery bags, straws, takeout containers. So things that we as people, as consumers use on a daily basis. So how does it all get there? Like I said before, improper waste management. So it should be recycled, it's thrown in the trash. Um, it is, uh, it falls, it gets transported across the ocean on a ship that is transporting waste, some of it falls off into the ocean. Um, and it's also through a lot of littering. People throw their trash um, instead of recycling it or in the garbage can, they throw it on the streets and plastic is lightweight. It can get blown um, into streams, make its way, its way to the shorelines, to the oceans. And then sometimes it's in, intentionally dumped at sea as well. Um, because there aren't a lot of regulations around dumping out in international waters. Um, people and the ocean is big. And so if you're out there on a ship and you're the only one around, people will just toss it overboard. Um, and that happens a lot more than it should. And a lot of plastics make their way from the ocean onto other beaches. And some beaches in particular on our planet are kind of magnets for this plastic. And um, the reason behind that, why some beaches look like this, this is not just because people are dumping their trash here, although that's a, a big reason, but sometimes the, the ocean brings it to these islands. And that's due to um, ocean currents and things called gyres. And um, gyres are like giant whirlpools in the ocean. Uh, and they transport plastic particles or any particles really. And they get, they trap them in these whirlpools. And there are certain places in the ocean, such as in the Pacific Ocean, where there are these gyres that are collecting trash and they're called known as garbage patches. And I'm sure everybody has heard of a garbage patch, but um, there are just places in the ocean where they collect big sections of trash and the garbage patches um, are like the Pacific garbage patches bigger than the state of Texas or estimated at least to be bigger than the state of Texas. And then sometimes currents will um, come through and sweep some of those particles out of the gyres and transport them to islands. So you can kind of see in this graphic here that there are some islands where those currents are moving the particles or the trash to, uh, to that island. So for example, this is Henderson Island and you can see all of this trash up here on, in the beach, on the beach. Um, and that is just because of the way the currents in the ocean work, it just makes beaches like Henderson Island kind of a hot spot for trash. And that's not the only one, there are several islands, um, remote islands that are receiving a lot of waste from our oceans. 
Okay, so when you hear the word garbage patch, um, I know when I first heard of a garbage patch, I pictured something like this, basically like a giant raft of floating plastic, like as far as the eye could see, you could like walk on top of it. And that would be horrible. Um, but what's even more terrifying to me is that it doesn't look like this. It looks like this. You can't see it. A lot of the plastic in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch and the other garbage garbage patches on our planet, uh, you cannot see the plastic that is in them. And that is because um, plastic is always breaking down into smaller and smaller pieces. And a lot of the plastic that you'll find is looks like this or even smaller where you have to look at it under a microscope to be able to see it and this is what's known as microplastics so this would be um, particles either a larger piece of plastic that's broken down over time into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces um, or it could be things like microbeads which are in the process of being phased out but they exist in things like toothpaste and face washes, things like that you, they're good little scrubbers um, for your teeth and your skin uh, without being too abrasive. And those get washed down the drain and eventually end up in the ocean. Um, we also see particles like these um, look like threads that are in here. These are microfibers from like washing fleece clothing. So that's where a lot of the plastics um, that you'll see in the ocean that you'll scoop out of those garbage patches are actually microscopic or very, very small. Um, and we know that any size plastic, whether it's really big or really tiny is actually is a big problem. So animals get stuck. And this is um, not a sea turtle, but this can happen to sea turtles as well, where they get stuck in a ring of six, like a six pack ring. And then like you can see this turtle shell has actually grown around the ring because um, it's been stuck in it for a long time. But um, so plastics in general are a huge problem because animals can get stuck in them animals can eat them. This is a photo. It looks like a jellyfish, but it's not. It's a disintegrating plastic bag in the water. And if you can't tell upon first glance whether it's a bag or a jellyfish, neither can sea turtles. And sea turtles love to eat plastic bags. Um, also, surprising development that just came out this year that plastics smell like food to turtles. Um, plastics are a great breeding ground for bacteria and the turtles are actually can actually smell the bacteria that are growing on the plastic and they eat the plastic thinking it's a food. Uh, they also think that's why turtles eat jellyfish because the bacteria are growing on the jellyfish as well and the jelly the turtles can seek out the jellyfish by their smell. Um, so they're smelling that bacteria growing on the jellyfish, the same bacteria grows on the plastic, and um, the turtles eat the plastic thinking that it's food. So it doesn't just look like food to them, it smells like food. Uh, so plastic doesn't just stay on the surface of the ocean. Um, it's estimated that at least as much trash and plastic in general is on the bottom of the ocean in the deep sea as it is in those giant gyres. So there's as much microplastics, large plastics, everything in the deep ocean as there is on the surface. Just a couple of examples. Um, NOAA Ocean Explorer found this jar on the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico with looks like some sort of um, shell or some creatures living inside of it. And this was in 2018, but they've definitely found plastic every time they dive. Uh, this is another image from that same dive. This is a plastic garbage bag with anemones that are growing on top of it. Again, in the Gulf of Mexico, 2018. But pretty much every time we dive in, into the deep sea with some sort of submersible or remotely operated vehicle, we are finding trash and a lot of trash. Um, 
the current in the deep sea transport trash to specific places, just like those gyres are transporting trash um, to specific spots in the ocean. They're taking it down into the deep sea as well. Uh, this is the remains of a mylar balloon in the Gulf of California from last year on an expedition. Uh, this particular expedition, they saw lots of trash. And the, I think the current specifically are bringing the trash to spots in the Gulf of California and collecting it there. Uh, there's all sorts of things, not just plastic either, just all sorts of trash. Um, my boss likes to say one of the first times she went down to the bottom, she found uh, they saw a refrigerator on the bottom of the ocean and someone had intentionally dumped it there. They had like shot it with a shotgun so it would sink by putting holes in it so water could infiltrate the whole body of the refrigerator. So there's lots of stuff in the ocean um, besides plastic. But plastic is a huge problem because again, it breaks down into tinier and tinier particles. So for example, um, plastic's making its way to everywhere in the ocean, including the deepest part of the ocean, which is the Mariana Trench, which is over seven miles deep in, the, in one specific spot. And this is a sea creature that was newly discovered um, in the last year or so. It's, um, name is Uritenus plasticus because of the plastic particles that are found in its stomach. Um, it is a tiny crustacean. So the particles that you're gonna see inside this guy are microscopic pieces of plastic, not like, not like a bottle cap, like something you need to see under the microscope. All right, I'm gonna play a video for you guys. This will, review a couple of things that I talk about, I talked about already, but maybe be interesting and enlightening as well about plastic in the ocean. Plastic, as we know it, has only been widely used since Tupperware was invented in the 1940s. But now, it is nearly impossible to go a day without it. And as useful as it is, plastic also causes some serious problems. You've heard about these things. Turtles caught in six-pack rings, garbage patches as large as Texas, and beaches with more plastic debris than sand. After all, millions of tons of plastic end up in our oceans every year. But as bad as all that sounds, some other consequences of plastic pollution might still surprise you. For one, plastics can emit greenhouse gases basically forever, not just during the making and disposing of them. Plastic is basically just a long chain of molecules, and when it's exposed to sunlight, UV radiation starts to break that chain down into smaller molecules like methane and ethylene in a process called off-gassing. Both of these are greenhouse gases, but methane is especially bad because it's 25 times better at trapping heat in our atmosphere than carbon dioxide. Side. And as plastic breaks down, the problem actually gets worse, not better. Researchers have found that as more surfaces get exposed, there's a huge increase in the release of gases. For example, a common plastic called LDPE, or low-density polyethylene, releases methane 488 times faster in a powdered form than in a pellet form. To make matters worse, once this off-gassing process begins, it can continue, even without sunlight. That's because those first broken bonds make the rest of the plastic more brittle, so it more easily breaks down on its own. Over time, it keeps breaking into smaller and smaller and eventually invisible particles. And as it does, it releases greenhouse gases into the air. Unfortunately, that's still not the end of the story. These indestructible pieces of plastic are also contributing to another modern problem, antibiotic resistance. In a 2020 study out of Northern Ireland, scientists collected bacteria from plastic found all along the Irish coastline and tried to kill them with 10 commonly used antibiotics, which turned out to be surprisingly hard to do. 98% of the bacteria were resistant to ampicillin, one of the most commonly prescribed antibiotics for things like sinus and ear infections. And 16% of the bacteria were resistant to minocycline, another type of antibiotic. Unfortunately, plastic 
Arctic is a great breeding ground for bacteria because they will grow on any available surface in the ocean. And many antibiotic-resistant bacteria are already out there. Plastics just give them more places to flourish. Once again, the problem gets worse as plastics break down because they create even more surface area for bacteria to colonize. And these bacteria don't just stay way out in the ocean. The same study showed that ocean currents can carry plastic covered in bacteria back into coastal waterways where different species could ingest them. Unfortunately, another 2020 study found that bacterial growth on marine plastics actually makes these plastics smell like food to sea turtles. So animals could be eating plastic because it smells good rather than because it looks like food. Which is not great. Ingesting plastic covered in antibiotic resistant bacteria could create health problems for marine animals, but also for creatures higher up the food chain, including us. Now, as plastic breaks down, it breaks into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces, and some of the smallest particles of plastic are capable of doing the most harm. Any plastic that's smaller than a few micrometers is called a nanoparticle. And research has found that these microscopic particles can even pass through biological barriers, like cell membranes. That means they can enter the bloodstream of animals, pass through the gut lining, and penetrate tissues. They can also accumulate in organs like the liver, kidneys, and intestines. Plastic nanoparticles have even been found to penetrate the blood-brain barrier, a layer of cells that filter harmful substances out of the blood so they can't get into the brain. This seems to be dangerous no matter where you are on the food chain. In a 2017 study out of Sweden, researchers exposed a zooplankton called Daphnia magna to a bunch of plastic nanoparticles. The Daphnia consumed these particles, and scientists found that while the larger particles didn't seem to affect them, the smallest particles, around 50 nanometers, were deadly. Next, to see the effect of nanoparticles higher up the food chain, they exposed a group of Daphnia to the plastic nanoparticles again, and then fed them to some fish called Crucian carp. Over the next two months, the carp started to change. They swam slower, explored less of their environment, and lost more weight than the control group. When the researchers analyzed the fish afterward, they found the 53 nanometer particles they had fed to the Daphnia were in the fish's brains. And they think these invisible particles changed the carp's behavior. These findings show that plastic nanoparticles can move up the food chain and interfere with the natural function of an ecosystem. And if we eat fish that have ingested nanoparticles, researchers suggest that could even have a direct impact on us. Plastic is everywhere, in every environment on our planet, and it's not going away anytime soon. In some ways, that's great, because plastic can really be useful. But unfortunately, it has some impacts that nobody was thinking about when they invented Tupperware. So the less plastic we use, and the more we understand the consequences, the better we can protect ourselves and our planet's natural ecosystems. Thanks for watching this episode of SciShow. If you want to learn more about ways to make this planet a better... All right, I'm going to stop it there. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Anyway, so uh, with that note, I'm sure people watching uh, have some great ideas about what you can do to help. And hopefully you are already doing some of these and know about them. But if not, maybe I can give you a few ideas about what you can do to help. And please share these ideas and this webinar with friends and family so that they have the knowledge to, to help um, protect our oceans from more plastic. Uh, the first thing I always like to tell people is refuse. So we've heard um, reduce, reuse, recycle, the three R's, but really there's a fourth one and it should be the most important one. And that's just simply refuse the plastic to begin with. So say no to single use plastics like plastic bags, um, plastic straws. These are easy things that you can say no to um, as a consumer. So if you're out at a restaurant and you get offered a straw, say no thank you. Um, if you're grocery shopping and you get to choose between plastic or paper, choose paper or bring your own bags. So you can do some things as a consumer to refuse the plastic to begin with. And the more people that do that, the less likely um, we are to have so much of it in our waste system. Um, and also that can, you know, the more people that do this, that can change behaviors of um, large corporations and large companies. Um, 
eventually if they have less people using say plastic bags at grocery stores um there will not be plastic bags at grocery stores uh you can also use your right as a voter if you are old enough to vote or you have parents who vote and they can vote for legislation that makes it um, illegal to have plastic bags in stores, which I know some states are already working on doing, which I think is great. Um, okay, from there, you can reduce. So reduce how much you personally use. Start small, start out with what you, just take a look at what you use in your everyday, house, everyday home that is single use plastic. Do you buy bottled water? Can you think of a more sustainable way to do that than using a single use plastic water bottle every time? Could you buy, invest in a reusable water bottle? Could you um, use a reusable coffee cup? Could you stop eating takeout every day and instead bring your lunch once a week? And it doesn't have to be all or nothing. It can be you just make one small behavior change and eventually it grows into something larger. I think that's where a lot of people kind of get hung up is you feel like you have to do it all or nothing. And that's not true. Um, just do the best you can. And if it's just one behavior that you change, that is awesome. Because if we all did that, it would make a huge impact instead of people getting hung up on the fact that they have to completely change their lives to make something better. Um, and then that just kind of makes people stop and not do any of it. Um, okay, and then after you reduce, then you can reuse. You could, um, again, get reusable containers like reusable water bottle, coffee cup, things you bring your lunch in, and you can also reuse some of those single-use plastics. So like you finish a tub of sour cream and you use that tub to store your leftovers in. Um, you, when I use like a plastic Ziploc bag at home, um, I will rinse it out and dry it and reuse it until it's no longer reusable. And then that makes it, you know, instead of me using a new plastic bag every single time, I have stopped that many um, plastic bags from going into the waste stream. Instead, I'm just using one over and over again until I ha do have to throw it away. But it just reusing sometimes works better. And then the very last thing on that list should be recycle because recycling is awesome, um, but recycling plastic is hard to do. It's uh, very it can be very toxic. We actually send a lot of our plastics to be recycled in other countries um, because we don't want to deal with the recycling process that is involved with plastic. And a lot of those countries we send to are saying, no, thank you, we don't want it anymore. So now what do we do with all of this plastic waste that we can't recycle responsibly? Um, and recycling rules vary by from city to city. Um, or from state to state. So what's recyclable where I live may not be recyclable where you live, but it's up to us as recyclers and consumers to know those rules. And not everybody always knows those rules. And you also have to keep in mind that um, your plastics or whatever you're recycling needs to be clean, that your recycling um, company will view it as like a um, contaminated waste if it still has food in it and they'll just throw it in the garbage. Or even if you take like a plastic bottle and you stick it inside a cardboard box and you throw all that in your recycling bin, they will say this is waste because we don't want to go through the effort of separating the two and we'll just throw it all in the garbage. So you have to be a little careful about how you recycle and what you recycle. Because uh, it very quickly, if we do it wrong, it can make a whole can full of recycling now become garbage because garbage companies and recycling companies are picking up lots and lots of recycling from people and they don't have the time or the manpower to sort through all of it. Um, so just something to keep in mind. That's why recycling is the last on that list. Uh, here's a fun movie that is really informative and short. It's 45 minutes, I think. 
um, about plastic and recycling that's pretty eye-opening about recycling. And again, some of those rules, um, how they vary from city to city, state to state, country to country. Uh, Bag It, it's a really great movie. It's cute. I show it to middle school kids um, every year and they, they enjoy it. Um, so it's a good one and you should be able to watch it for free, I believe. So this is their website if you want to check it out. Um, and then I am my work website, which is ecogig.org. And if you go backslash ways dash to dash protect dash the dash ocean, um, we have a little card that you can print um, and there's different, there's like a wallet size printable on there. Um, and there's also like a handout printable, which is great for classroom use in the future. Um, this is just some tips that you can protect the world's ocean. Uh, there's lots of things on here, but a few of them are about managing plastics. So that's something helpful to have. And then that is all I have for today. Um, so if you like these webinars, please visit our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com backslash ecogig org EPO. Um, uh, all the other webinars I've done so far live there and you can watch them. They're all of the same format. And then our website will announce future webinars, ecogig.org. Uh, there's a home, there's a slide on the home page that links out to another page um, that shows all the webinars and also links to specific ones that I've done in the past as well, if you're looking for something in particular. Um, okay, and so with that, I'll take any questions anybody has, um, or if there's just any general ocean questions, or if you are looking for more webinars and you have an idea for what you'd like to see in the future, I'm open to suggestions. Um, also, please feel, feel free to email me, ecogigoutreach at gmail.com. That's the best way to reach me. Um, so with that, I'll take questions if anybody has them. Otherwise, I'll go ahead and end the webinar for today. And I thank you in advance for everybody participating. Like I said before, if you want to put a question in the chat, that's the best place for a question. I'll wait for just a minute for anybody typing. But otherwise, I will, um, I will end it. <laughs> so thank you again for everybody who participated today. I appreciate it. it looks like I don't have any questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and end. Um, thank you everybody who came to listen today. All right.